Now moving on to our final session, influences on future quality matters. At this section of our programme, we are going to be looking at the many factors that are influencing quality assurance and our qualification system. With a range of topics from exploring what exactly we mean by quality, what influence can climate action play, what are the messages from Europe and ENQA, and what role will equality, diversity and conclusion have? First, we're going to have a short video. Professor Paul Giller couldn't be with us today. He's former registrar and senior vice president um, academic at University College Cork um, and Emeritus Professor of Ecology. He's going to present in this short video his work to date, commissioned by the QQI, on exploring and scoping the quality assurance system. Hello, I'm Professor Paul Giller. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I hope this recorded lecture works for you. This is an outline of my talk, and we're uncovering quite a lot of ground. And obviously in the short time, I can only touch on certain aspects of each of the topics. So I'll start with what is quality in education. And defining quality continues to be very difficult. There's a number of challenges. The first challenge is that quality is in the eye of the beholder, meaning different things to many different stakeholders and being subject to a diversity of drivers. Now this figure illustrates the diversity of internal and external stakeholders and drivers that are influencing either di directly or indirectly the quality in education and also in individual institutions. Now, many of these may well be looking at very different outcomes or driving institutions in different directions at the same time. There are also mutual influences between the stakeholders and the drivers. So it's quite a complex ecosystem. Now, a second challenge is that quality is a multi-dimensional concept. So actually making a simple definition is bound to be problematic. And thirdly, quality is a dynamic concept. It's reflective of the larger educational, economic, political and social landscape. That all makes up the quality ecosystem. However, a number of conceptual models have been proposed and I just want to quickly highlight Two. The first is a simple model that's based on Harvey and Green's 1993 paper with the interrelated concepts of quality in education, including excellence, fitness for purpose, transformation of the, the student, value for money, and consumer satisfaction or perfection of the system. And these vary in relation to their internal or external focus. The second is a more complex uh, conceptual model by Schindler et al. And it illustrates both the central goals and outcomes in these inner quadrants and the quality indicators that can be used to assess whether the identified goals and outcomes have been achieved in the, the outer ring. So you can see accountable, purposeful, transformative, exceptional are the, the key central goals. Now over the last three decades, educational quality assurance has developed to a very well institutionalized regulatory field. But there's been a constant dilemma or tension behind it. And it's basically whether quality assessment systems should be designed to promote continuous improvement in education, or whether these systems should focus on accountability of institutions and systems to, for example, funding bodies, government, etc. Now, traditionally, there have been four broad approaches to, to quality assurance, accreditation, audit, assessment, and external review of service and outcome standards. But we can now add two more, enhancement-focused and risk-based 
approaches. The object of attention of, of quality assurance ranges from the learner through the program or subject to the institution, and as we know, even to the QA system itself. There are differences between the QA approaches in, in different countries, and, and these differences are due to several different issues. The degree of maturity of the educational system, the cultural differences which affect how quality and level are defined. Data is not always available in the, the same form and opinions do differ on which indicators of quality should be used to measure it. The basic structures of the educational systems in different countries and individual programs differ. And also there are national variation in educational objectives and societal values. The basic quality assurance process and the organisation of reviews is quite similar, however, in, for example, the European higher education area. There's a combination of the internal quality assurance framework, which in self-accrediting institutions provides for the degree awarding, also identifying ameliorating risks, and there's a continuous improvement that can be generated through this internal QA supported by external review, which can lead to programme and institutional accreditation from the QA agency. It provides accountability to the statutory funding bodies. It can support professional accreditation. And the external review also feeds into continuous improvement and into identifying and ameliorating risks. And what is also evident is that the behaviour, orientation and engagement of institutions with quality assurance varies in respect of the, the degree of engagement with quality assurance and their enthusiasm for and responsiveness to quality assurance. And at the top right here you have engaged enthusiast institutions, reflective and learning organisations where quality and quality assurance are fully integrated into their culture and strategy, enhancement focused in teaching and learning and student and staff development. Also the competitor institution, prestige seeking, which has a similar engagement but perhaps for, for different reasons. And down here at the bottom left you have the perhaps arrogant rebellious institution, limited quality culture, focus more on product delivery rather than enhancement. QA process is not considered as applicable or necessary and there may even be a refusal to engage with external QA processes. The fragile or distracted institution is unable to really engage with QA. The reluctant adherent does all that it's necessary to do reluctantly. The minimalist does the minimum. And the omnivore has a combination of all these different types within their own institution across the different schools uh, and uh, programs. Institutional cultures and attitudes will change over time in, in light of the importance of leadership and the institutional values. Hence this typology of institutions is likely to be quite fluid. And does it matter? Well, I think the review and the site visit would look completely different between different institutions, such as the engaged enthusiast and the arrogant institution. How do we know that QA works? Well, quality assessment costs money, time, goodwill. So what additional quality has been added above and beyond what we would normally expect associated with professional enhancement of teaching and research, for example? There is sufficient evidence in the literature to assert that overall results of the introduction of quality insurance have been positive. There are a number of well-recognised and documented benefits of QA. This list on, the, on this slide is a, is a subset and in, I'll only highlight just a, a, a few. So we've got enhanced quality of programmes or processes, new formal standards and quality levels there's been a weeding out of bad provision. There's retention rates, graduation rates, 
level of final awards, graduate employment, all seem to have improved where performance data is subject to external evaluation. There's been a provision of system-wide information on, on best practices and common problem areas. And it's been found that the external QA system is a very effective way to make things happen at a national and at an institutional level. But there are costs, perceived drawbacks in, in QA systems. There's issues of financial costs and increased bureau bureaucratic burden. External QA can actually be an institutional risk. There's opportunities for game playing, window dressing and deceptive practices by institutions. And quality assurance and accreditation systems tend to be more conservative, imposing particular models, certain canonised curricula, as well as established delivery modes. But there are also other issues that raise questions about the validity of current QA systems. For example, grade inflation. How, how can this be explained if QA processes are working properly? How could quality have been maintained in the face of the off-stated chronic underfunding of the educational sector? We've got geopolitical pressures now, for example, Brexit or Russian invasion of Ukraine that raises doubts about agreed values in the European higher education area. And we have a rise in online and remote education that bring with them threats to academic integrity. So much has changed over 30 years of quality assurance and yet we're still using many of the same methodologies and principles that were introduced at the start of the process. Recent modest updating of the ESG has taken place. Is it enough? I think the sense is that it's the right time to re-evaluate current QA systems in Ireland, and this is actually happening elsewhere. So what might the features of a, a renewed QA system be? Well, here are just a, a few ideas. Ideally, QA should be an internally driven process by an engaged, enthusiast institution to improve and learn, deliver the best education, research and service. Effective internal quality culture requires a clear institutional autonomy and therefore greater trust from government. And I think the QA system should be more relaxed about knowing everything, more forward-looking, less burdensome. There needs to be a diversity of QA approaches to match the diversity of institution, their strategy, their history, their activities. Move away from a one-size-fits-all system. It may require legislative change. We might think of including additional elements for assessment, such as the green agenda, sustainability, institutional values, and these may need the support of additional specialist agencies in the overall process, for example, the EPA. We could conceive of the development of a more thematic, strategic QA system with horizontal all-at-once review rather than the current vertical, sequential institutional review cycles, or maybe a combination in a kind of T-shaped overall system. And also institutions themselves need to be more altruistic, sharing best practice for the good of the entire system. Are there exemplars? Are there guiding images we might look toward? Scotland, Finland, Australia perhaps? What can be learnt from other areas that use QA, such as industry? What is the future of quality assurance? Does it need supplements? or major surgery. I think time will tell. I've benefited greatly from discussions with a range of experts and practitioners in QA that are, are listed here. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Professor Jane Stout, Vice President for Biodiversity and Climate Action with Trinity Coll College Dublin. Jane is going to talk about how climate action will impact on quality and qualifications. Jane Stout. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Um, so I've been asked to speak about how climate action will impact on quality and qualifications. Uh, climate action, uh, the, the responses that we, we make to the global challenge of climate change will impact everything that we do as individuals, as citizens, and of course, as educators across all of our institutions. But perhaps, unlike uh, current socio-political challenges, it's not a sudden crisis, and it's not something that's unexpected. So scientists have been warning society for decades uh, that we are in, uh, in trouble in terms of uh, our environmental situation. So in 1992, 1,700 scientists came together and published a, a paper that was a warning to humanity based on deteriorating trends in various aspects of the environment. 25 years on, in 2017, more than 15,000 scientists produced uh, a second warning because things just weren't getting better. And you can see in these graphs that I've put on the slide here, the change between the first paper in 1992 uh, and uh, the second paper in 2017 is the bold line uh, on each of those graphs. And you can see the trajectories are still going in the same direction. So we're still seeing um, freshwater resources per capita, forest area, and vertebrate uh, numbers declining. We're still seeing temperature, uh, carbon dioxide emissions and human and livestock populations increasing. And just last week, many of you may or may not have heard uh, the latest Living Planet report, uh, which documented that 69% there's been a 69% decline in abundance of vertebrate animals since 1970. Just let that sink in for a minute. 69% decline. That's nearly 70% of all of the birds, fish, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians that were on the planet 50 years ago are not here today. So massive loss of biodiversity. Nature is literally on its knees. And as the planet warms and as biodiversity is lost, this threatens our homes, our health, our food, and our livelihoods. So, of course, we will see the impact of these challenges in the education sector. There are practical implications for our campuses, so changes in the, the heating, the cooling systems for our buildings, how we dispose of waste, how we manage our grounds, the food we consume. But we will also see implications uh, on, on the, for the research that we do. Um, we already see the focus of funding agencies shifting to find solutions to these environmental challenges. And of course, this crisis for humanity, the degradation of health of our planet, will influence how we educate our students who will have to deal with these issues in their futures and in the workplace. And many of us know this. Uh, we're a well-informed society. Indeed, information has never been so accessible. It's no longer locked up in the libraries of inaccessible institutions. Data are available to, to everyone. We know about climate change. We know about the importance of climate action. And we know the effects that not taking action may have on us. Yet how we interact with knowledge has changed, as Blonard explained this morning. And how do people find their way through this barrage of information? What, how do we know what action to take? How do we know what action will have the most impact? And this is where our institutions play a role in the future, through the generation of knowledge, through innovation, and through translating and distilling this information for students as well as for policy and society. And so we have a responsibility as educators to educate our students in this context so that they can sift through the rhetoric uh, and really understand the challenge that environmental degradation brings and what to do about it. And there is an urgency around change. The planet has already warmed by 1.3 degrees. We're going to hit 1.5 degrees in the next decade. And this will bring irreversible consequences. And at the same time as we have a warming planet, as I say, we've got this slight, silent chip, chip, chip of biodiversity loss as we lose individuals, so we see declines in abundance. We also lose species, we lose habitats through destruction and degradation of nature. And together, these twin challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss will diminish the benefits that we get from nature. So change is needed. Uh, change is required. It needs to be transformational. The, the, the scope and scale of the change that is, is required cannot be underestimated. Changes need to be systemic. 
Um, so they need to occur right through our societies and systems, but they also need to be genuine. We can't afford to, to not do this well. And so quality education is needed, and not only in the natural sciences, the traditional uh, place of these environmental issues. We need lawyers, politicians, economists who are educated in environmental issues. We need the creative arts to appreciate and communicate about nature and our link to it and our place within it. Uh, we need health scientists who can cope with the changes in disease type and prevalence in a warming planet and other physical and mental health challenges that are coming. And we need STEM education to recognize that the challenges of the future will need novel ways of thinking. But the key thing is that we need to make sure that education cuts across these disciplines and that it integrates them. We can't have this silo thinking. We need these transversal skills. Because sustainability is about facing environmentally cha environmental challenges in a, a socially just and economically viable way. We need to educate our students within the donut that Linda Doyle spoke about earlier this morning, in the space between the ecological ceiling that we can't exceed and the social foundation that we shouldn't want to go below. The European Commission has recognized this and called for environmental sustainability to be at the core of education and training across the European Union and have recognized that currently it's not. Uh, and the JRC has developed a competence framework on sustainability that maps out the competencies that our students will need in the future. At a national level earlier this year, the second national strategy on education for sustainable development was published, highlighting that it's more important than ever that students address these issues. Uh, we're not starting from ground zero. Uh, third level sector has, is already mobilized, is already mobilizing. Some have been working in these areas for years. We have green campuses. We have formal and informal programs on sustainability. We have linking across disciplines. We have uh, positive change starting to occur. And there are lots of international as well as national networks and groups for collaboration, for partnership, for sharing learning. And we're going to need these. We're all faced with the same problems, with the same issues. Um, we need, as I say, this transformational, genuine, positive change, and we need to get there together. In Trinity, we're trying to embed sustainability across the whole of everything that we do. So through our operations, through our research, and in our education. Uh, there are challenges, there are practical ones, like what targets to set and how to achieve them, what data to collect and how to report on them, how to fit biodiversity and climate action into the curriculum in a meaningful way, how to fund this, given the shortage of funding in the Irish HEI sector, and how to recognise and reward staff and students for their efforts, how to avoid greenwashing uh, and make genuine change, and how to embed this change rather than just adding it on as another tick box exercise. There are lots of options in terms of embedding um, sustainability in our uh, education, including creation of foundational model modules. Um, so these could be modules that are taken at the beginning of a program uh, or prior to entering a program or at early stages in a program. But we need to address uh, uh, how to maintain quality in these kinds of modules and, again, make sure that they're more than just a tick box, that they're not just so simple and straightforward that everyone can do them. They need to be challenging. We can create specialized modules, so modules that are open across disciplines, that integrate between disciplines, and, of course, we can um, build on and create more specialized programs uh, at undergraduate, postgraduate level and others. Uh, there are risks if that we uh, have our specialised education siloed or in, in boxes that um, it's not accessible to everyone. So this is why open foundational modules that everyone can take is perhaps a good plan. But specialised programmes can enable students to go into more depth, be more specific. And also, we need to remember uh, that it's not just all about the, the third level uh, and university level programs. Lifelong learning, uh, pre and post third level is important. And the higher education sector can't do this all by itself. 
Partnerships are important. Every public and private body is facing similar challenges. The challenges that we face are not just local to us here, they're not just local to us in Ireland, they are global. So partnership, knowledge sharing, sharing infrastructure, doing things differently, having joined up thinking is all required. So just to summarize, in terms of how biodiversity and climate action, and I've added the word biodiversity in there because it's not all about climate, it's not just all about carbon, how biodiversity and climate action will uh, impact on quality and qualifications, we need urgent action, and we need action across various aspects of nature. As I say, we can't just focus on carbon. This will impact what we do as educators and how we do it. What we teach and how we teach it must be genuine. And not just in the classroom, but by practicing what we preach, linking the local and global in terms of the theoretical uh, aspects as well as the practical. And I think one of the key points is transdisciplinarity. So beyond multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, but those partnerships outside uh, of the education system as well, uh, and engaging in the, and, and being aware of lifelong learning and partnerships uh, in, in innovative contexts. And within the context of the current political and socioeconomic precarity that we exist, the challenges associated with biodiversity loss and climate change and their impacts demand quality in our qualifications, and we have a responsibility to deliver this alongside other more practical actions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stout. Now to welcome Douglas Blackstock, the president of ENQA, the European Association for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. Douglas is going to provide us with the future's perfect, uh, perspectives from the European quality, uh, from European quality assurance, and indeed from a global perspective, as ENQA has many international connections. Douglas Blackstock. Well, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you. It is an enormous privilege and pleasure to be back at Croke Park. I was last here 32 years ago, caught Galway in the All-Ireland final. I don't have a clue what happened. I don't know who won. I don't know anything that went on, but it was a great day. Um, I actually looked up the score last night, and I still don't understand <laughs> what happened. I think the people from Galway seem to go away happier than the others. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Dublin for our good friends and colleagues QQI. I remember the birth pangs of QQI because as a director and later chief executive of QAA in the UK, I worked with all the predecessor organisations. And it is an enormous test of the resilience and a sense of the leadership of your national agency that this team of people have taken QQI through 10 years to be one of the most respected and trusted quality bodies, not just in Europe, but in the world. But it's 10 years of QQI. Um, they paid me a lot of money for that, by the way. It's not only 10 years of QQI. We also have Lawrence here from Malta's Further and Higher Education Authority, who celebrated 10 years last week as well. So congratulations to MFHEA and, of course, as Pori said, 25 years of QA. There's one other agency I'd like to mention, and we heard a bit about their country this morning. It is marvellous to be in this room together, isn't it? Three weeks ago, I was in Istanbul, where two colleagues from Ukraine made a two-day journey to get out of the country to come and engage with their colleagues. Your counterparts in universities and quality bodies are today in bomb shelters, teaching students remotely. Let's do everything we can to support our colleagues in Ukraine as we go forward. Uh, I'll be very brief about Berenka because my colleague Goran covered earlier. We are the representative bodies of quality agencies and we benefit greatly through the engagement of QQI. My notes say nice, say nice things about QQI, but I'll come back to that later. Um, we represent right across the European higher education area, although we did take action as suspended our Russian members and affiliates. We are co-authors of the European standards and guidelines for quality, and we drive development of quality assurance in the broader European higher education area. We do that through a range of services, but also our political engagement 
with other organisations in Europe. QQI is one of our most engaged members. You have contributed a past president and current and former board members. You regularly contribute at events and webinars and are leading in our academ academic integrity working group, are key participants and mentors in our leadership development programme, hosted our General Assembly in 2015 and will do so again in 2023. In walking out with your minister, I said you need to know that Ireland punches above its weight in Europe because of the work of QQI. I, I want to speak a little bit about future perspectives of quality assurance in Europe. Uh, one of the things about the challenges when thinking about the future of QA is the huge diversity and context for higher education and quality assurance across our members. I often talk to Barbara and her colleagues in the States about the challenge of getting cohesion across the six regional accreditors in the US. Try it with 47 countries with different legal systems, cultural contexts and, and languages as well. Some agencies have a remit for external QA of education provision from institutions, but others only for programmes. Some, like Hacheres in France, cover research in their programmes. In Spain, the agencies approve the appointments of academics and professors. Could you imagine trying that in Ireland? <laughs> some cover different levels of education, QQI, FE and HE. Some have other wide-ranging functions. Some, such as QA in the UK, develop the qualifications frameworks. SKVC in Lithuania are also the ENIC and the NARIC. There's a broad diversity. And as that diversity is getting greater, as agencies explore new topics, as Goran said, find new ways to offer added value to the sector, that is particularly for the large and growing number of agencies that no longer get any public money and are entirely reliant on review fees. They're also seeking to remain relevant in a changing higher education landscape. And in one example in particular, Goran hinted, hinted at it, it may not have got through. In Germany, there is an open competitive market where institutions choose their agency based on price. It is such an unstable environment for the agencies, most of them would not survive in German revenues alone and are chasing around the world offering accreditation to make themselves financially sustainable. Many of the hot topics in European higher education at the moment are areas where Ireland and QQI are leading the way and having significant international impact. But these developments also pose challenges for the quality assurance agenda. Amongst the topics, there are many, uh, but micro-credentials. Changing, I think micro-credentials are a great opportunity to democratise access to higher education, but they have to be done right. Real opportunities for lifelong learning, knowledge and skills. But how do we know that that education and sometimes training is quality and meets the needs of the stakeholders that want it and are going to fund it? Our working group on micro-credentials is preparing guidance for quality assurance agency, and we know Ireland is leading the way in developing a clear approach for micro-credentials. Academic integrity, what a fantastic session earlier. What is the role of quality assurance agencies? I know in my six years as chief executive of QA, it was absolutely top of our priority. And actually, QA's campaign this year succeeded in legislation in Westminster to outlaw the advertising of SE Mills. We also have a working group on that, and QQI are in the lead. And our board met in Zaragoza in September and endorsed the Global Academic Integrity Network. In internationalisation, we have the development of the European University Alliances, a really interesting and exciting development of collaboration across borders. We have the growth and continued growth of transnational education and joint, joint projects. And there's been various initiatives to try and add impetus to addressing ongoing challenges for the implementation of existing approaches to quality assurance. We know from a conference in Paris earlier this year that colleagues from Croatia presenting said the European approach to QA of joint programmes is really easy to read, it's really easy to understand, but it's incredibly difficult to implement. They talked about a joint programme between Croatia and France where the, 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 the qualifications are described differently, the requirements in staff development are different, there is none in France, and the legal systems are incompatible. At the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference in Barcelona in June, there was a call for stricter rules on the quality assurance of cross-border 
education. I spoke at the OECD in September, encouraged them not to go down that direction, but to work harder to implement existing arrangements. And colleagues may not find it too welcome in this room, but what I said is we need cross-border, cross-regional collaboration, but also the big providers of TNE to step up and show transparency in the quality assurance of TNE. And that particularly is incumbent on the two largest, the vast majority of TNE is provided by two countries, England and Australia, who've moved in different directions, risk-based regulation for quality assurance. But I can tell you, there's a really live debate in the receiving countries of TNE at the moment about how are they getting guarantees of quality of provision in their countries. And then digitalization, online blended, all of the issues we heard, heard earlier, and we are working on updating our guidance. Through all of this, Quality assurance is key as a key tool to underpin, underpin trust and qualifications, regardless of the form, delivery or location. We're also working globally. Regional harmonisation of quality assurance is happening around the world. We've had the development of standards for quality assurance and qualification frameworks in both Africa and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And now we have the CIATHIS principles for quality assurance in Latin America. All of these are strongly aligned with European standards and frameworks, and we supported the development through capacity building work with our colleagues in Aquan and Africuan. Uh, there's an alignment between the different global approaches, and it's an important cross-border higher education and cross-border quality assurance development. All of these contribute to enhancing trust in each other's education systems, supporting partnerships, recognition, and mobility. ENCA maintains a dialogue with all of the regional networks and at our meeting in Stockholm next week, we will have speakers from Africa, Southeast Asia and the Gulf. While other regions are in the early stages of development of their QA and qualification frameworks, we are at the starting point for a second revision of our main tool, the European Standards and Guidelines. But it will take a lot to move away from some of the existing fundamental principles of quality assurance. We had the presentation a few minutes ago, and I've heard this numerous times now, about broadening the scope of QA. I would say let's stick to the knitting and talk about quality assurance of learning and teaching. That's, what we, that's the business we're in. I think adding a whole range of new and additional things in will actually increase the burden rather than lessen it of quality assurance. But together with other stakeholder organisations, we're about to launch a large-scale consultation on the current state and future of the European Quality Assurance Framework. The Irish Universities Association is a partner in the project. What is being discussed? Are the European standards and guidelines fit for purpose in the changing HE landscape? Do they allow sufficient room for flexibility in innovation and quality assurance, while at the same time serving systems with less mature QA systems? We keep an open mind, and I think it's likely to be an evolution rather than a revolution. The fundamental principles underpinning quality assurance are the same, and that is one of the most, is the vast majority of QA is done in institutions themselves. We need to provide more space for flexibility uh, when making changes that will not move the goalposts for systems that have hardly got to catch up. And this morning, colleagues, I have to tell you the European Commission announced at a conference in Malta that they are developing their own standards for quality assurance for EU countries. So you and Ireland are going to be subject to EU standards and the EHEA standards. I think it's not the best step they have made. I understand the frustration about the glacial pace of the Bologna process, but to create a two-tier system in Europe, I think risks significant risk on the Bologna process in its entirety. Much better to work with the project that they're funding, with ENCA, EUA, Eurasia, and ESU and ECA to evolve the European standards and guidelines, taking on board their concerns and move in a new direction. So I think we'll all need to watch this space. And I will, colleague, finish with saying some more nice things about QA, QQI. It is a fantastic organisation. I know from having led an organisation for six years that was kicked left, right and centre by its government and by other bodies, what you miss when a national treasure is lost. QQI is a jewel in the crown of your higher education system. Be incredibly proud of it and the people that work in it.
Thank you, Douglas Blackstock. We're now going to have a short interview panel discussion. Dr. R Ross Woods is the Senior Manager at the Centre of Excellence for Quality, for Quality, Diversity and Inclusion at the Higher Education Authority. Ross will moderate and interview two national experts on EDI and consider what role they will have in quality matters, matters as we move forward. So we're going to hear from Dr. Lucy Michael, author and consultant on equality and integration issues. We're also going to hear from Dr. Philip Owende, Assistant Head of Ac Academic Affairs at TU Dublin. Over to you, Dr. Ross Woods. Thanks, Stella. Thank you very much. Um, well, I might continue your introduction for those of you who don't know, um, particularly Lucy. A lot of you will know Philip. Um, um, Lucy um, recently worked with, with, with uh, the HEA on producing the first ever report on race equality in higher education, which was a really groundbreaking moment for us as a, as a sector. So I'd just like to acknowledge that and, and thank her for that. And, and Philip is also someone who I've had the pleasure of working with in the, the EDI space. Philip is currently a member of the expert group who are undertaking the second national review of gender equality in higher education in Ireland. So we really are among experts um, today. Um, as Della said, the, 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 the focus of, of, of this conversation is around the role of EDI in education, and I suppose more generally in uh, quality and qualifications, given the, uh, where we are today. Um, I guess I'd also like to say um, it, this timing reminds me of when I was a lecturer. We used to call this the graveyard shift, so I'm <laughs> very pleased to see so many bodies, uh, warm bodies, still in the room. Um, but really, in, 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 at a national level, and not just in higher education and further education, across the whole territory system, the focus on EDI to date has really been on high-level policy. Uh, in the higher education sector, particularly, it's been looking at leadership, structures, um, training people, setting targets. But what I'd really like to consider today in conversation with Lucy and, and Philip is, is to draw on their differing areas of expertise and, and think about what the impact and role of EDI uh, will be on, the f on future QA and QA planning and, and, and what we, as all of us in the room, need to think about in that, that context. So I, I might start with you, Lucy, um, and people might actually now, after all that waffle, might be sitting here wondering, um, where do quality and qualifications meet equality? You know, what, what is the relevance? And what should we be thinking about, I suppose, at a strategic level, in, in your opinion? Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much for having me here today to join you for this conversation. I, I'm a former academic recovered, and uh, my whole career, 16 years in academia, was spent exploring equity and equality and diversity, particularly race equality, uh, through pedagogic innovation, through TNE, fly in, fly out DNA, uh, through QA processes in the UK and, and in China, um, and, and looking you know, back as far as 2009 at decolonizing a, a UK curriculum in China. So I was always driven by that idea of what can we do more um, and so when I had the opportunity to analyze the race equality survey for the HEA, I jumped at it. Because what an opportunity to find out what staff in so many institutions thought uh, about this subject. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, surveys going on at the moment around race equality. I think, Philip, you and I might agree there's a bit of consultation fatigue even happening around this area. Um, but I think what's, what's really interesting is when we ask about, you know, what are we doing here as, as QA interested people? We're talking about inclusive education for everybody. And very often I think what we find is that when, when a framework or a set of standards is silent on something, we perceive that as neutrality uh, instead of the silence that it is. And so for so long, we have seen that silence in quality assurance frameworks in the way that we judge what happens in higher education and further education. And we have seen an unsilencing of that around gender. It is time now to say that unsilencing has to happen around equity in general. We have 10 protected characteristics of equality in Ireland. Um, we have a lot more work to do in that area. 
But why QA? Because QA is one of the few very powerful mechanisms we have for periodic check-in and review, systematic accountability, and high-profile messaging. A QA, uh, I think, is extraordinarily powerful in this space. So it, what does EDI have to do with QA? Everything, I think, everything. And, it, and if I may say one more thing before you jump off to Philip, it's this. You know, one of the things that we are really bad at, I think, in third level, it, well, two things, if I may say. Uh, one is recognizing the need for this work. We have very often papered over the need for diversification of our research, our teaching, our curriculum, our student experience. We have, we have ignored it instead of building in the feedback loops that we need. And our feedback loops are almost to an institution unfit for purpose in terms of equity. Um, and the second thing is we have been really bad at recognizing the opportunities for equitable education and inclusive education. Uh, and that is in part because those things are also are papered over. They're not rewarded, they're not recognized, they're never illustrated to the wider community. And if we do one thing coming out of this conversation today, I, I want us to really, A, in this room, feel the need for this work in terms of our sustainability, in terms of the efficacy of our graduates in society and industry, in terms of how responsive we are in third level education, and get better at communicating that to the rest of our third level community. Okay, so a little bit of work to do there for the sound <laughs> of it. Um, Philip, I suppose Lucy's talking about some of the, the high level issues um, and how you know, we might start conceptualizing what EDI means and QA processes. Um, you have a lot of experience with these particular processes um, on the ground, I suppose. And so, so I was going to ask you, what would you say are the practical implications of integrating EDI into institutional quality assurance practice? Uh, thanks very much, Ross. Uh, first of all, uh, just to thank the QQI for uh, for enabling this. Uh, I know quite a number of people thanked uh, Dr. Podrick Walsh uh, for renting the room. I want to extend that a little bit further uh, and, and thank him for actually allowing for this transaction of the centrality of people, of students particularly, and then of staff in meeting the obligations in the higher education sector. Now, uh, coming back to what, uh, uh, to what uh, Ross uh, has asked there, uh, I, would, I would reflect back to uh, what uh, Dr. Linda Doyle spoke about this morning, and that is a good university. Now, for me, a good university is one that has people as the central theme, and then everybody builds around that. Now, by people, I, I mean students, and when you drill down on the students, you have apprenticeship students, you have undergraduate students, you have postgraduate students. At times when you lump all students together, you lose visibility of some of the, of some of the intricacies uh, of, of that, what that data tells you. Then when it comes to staff, you also, I mean, people normally think about just the academics. When you talk about quality, things about just the academics. But we are all aware that quality pervades the education system. It's the, it's the binding glue of professional services, students' uh, experience, and also the academic staff delivery. Now, remember that academic staff uh, also uh, have a life behind them. Uh, and again, going back to, to uh, uh, the, uh, what uh, Claude McGovern, uh, McGovern spoke about this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, in relation to uh, students for change. I think the catchphrase that your group, when they walked out of classes, uh, what they used was uh, academic and professional staff working conditions are student learning conditions. Now, for me, that caught quite a lot of things in the sense that it tells you that everything has to move together in quality terms. For, you, for us to be able to provide for the right student experience, we need to back it up by providing for appropriate ecosystem for staff to perform at their best, and then also for professional staff to contribute to supporting that. Now, again, uh, 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 how you handle EDI uh, in an academic environment, I can only say that 
uh, uh, EDI is a culture, it's a conviction. Uh, so therefore, it requires system thinking on how to integrate that. Now, by system thinking, I mean you look at the whole and look, look at the mean and look at the impact of the mean on the whole, uh, all tied up together. Now, there's nothing, when you look at what we look at in the key way, you have things like student experience, you have, uh, 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 you have curriculum, you have governance, you have internationalization, you have research, and the only thing that actually ties those together, and Lucy was right, that when you talk quality, everybody stands up. Now, the only difference is that at the moment, when you talk about quality assurance, people understand it as the minimum standard because you know that quality has to be graduated. It, it, it has to be enhanced all the time. So combine quality assurance and quality enhancement, then you have your own uh, uh, quality framework. And the good thing about not talking about quality assurance, but talking about enhancement and talking about framework, it enables innovation. It allows a bit of of academic freedom, it allows a bit of thinking out of the box, and it allows bringing things or borrowing things that work and bring them into the central student experience that we all want to, uh, or want to operate from. So, as a last remark, just to mention that EDI must be in an organization culture and because it is, it, is, it is the only way that you call for accountability every time something is missed. But the way quality assurance works at the moment is that it is not a carrot and stick situation. You allow contextualization. And in the context of allowing for contextualization, you enable a, a, a partnership that uh, uh, strengthening the, that strategic partnership that QQI is talking about here you enable iterative effect that encompasses learning, encompasses reflection, and again, you come back and simply ask. You put down the KPIs, you, you allow people to put their own KPIs based on their strategic plan. And when I started my career, somebody told me something that I think holds even up to now. If you are doing anything in the higher education sector and it's not in the strategic plan, know that you're a loser. <laughs> so, so, so uh, and I think that holds even up now that, that, that uh, the quality framework is, is aligned with the strategic plan. And any time you put in an EDI issue, somebody has not performed, next year they come and you, you actually call them to task, you call them to account. And each time there's an enhancement, there's improvement, and you borrow that from everybody else around you, and that is what generates best practice. Thanks, Ross. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> um, thanks, Philip, for the um, impassioned uh, defense of equal equality, diversity, and inclusion. Just, uh, uh, just one question which I'll pose to both of you because we're, we're just out of time. Um, and it goes back to something that Douglas said about widening scope and that stick to the nitty gritty and we shouldn't be you know, adding layer upon layer. But I guess, and um, you know, being in the EDI space, it, it's not about adding on EDI is what I'm hearing, it's about mainstreaming EDI. Would that be right? Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, if you ask me, all institutions should be EDI by default, rather than any other way. And that's the way you work it out. Lucy, I'll leave the last word to you. Oh, I avoid the word mainstreaming because it's been so abused for so long, where mainstreaming means silencing minorities and those in small numbers. Um, so I would say this instead. Um, equitable practice is already within what we do, but we have not seen it, we have not recognized it, and we have not rewarded it, and it has not been in the strategic plan. Um, and I think what, what we have seen really well is that we have a tendency to go to very specific things like the Athena Swan framework, right? We just focus on gender. And now to say to all these gender specialists and experts, okay, we're gonna shift and do something different. Actually, just the, the practice of doing that is not saying we're adding something on, we're not adding on nine equality grounds to gender. We're actually saying, 
you're already doing this practice. Let's use the nudge to say, let's make this a more, a more comprehensive practice. Um, and I think, you know, one of the comments I'm just seeing on the screen there about community education by its nature provides opportunities for inclusive and equitable education. Yeah. It does, but so often we're narrowly defining who is community. And, you know, we, for all of the successes we've seen, we've also seen very stark failures. And those failures are because we are too rigid in our delivery. We are too rigid in our thinking. And we already know so many of the issues that are, create barriers for people into and within uh, third level education. And we have to start acknowledging that research literature uh, and really relating it to our practice. Okay. Um, I'll just say thanks to Philip and Lucy. Thanks for that. Uh, our very final speaker today is Dr. Brian Maguire, Director of Integration at QQI. Brian is going to present the QQI perspective on the future of quality assurance, supporting our quali qualifications. Over to you, Brian. Uh, thank you. Uh, QQI didn't get where it has gotten over the last 10 years without being flexible. It's after five o'clock, so forget about the slides, uh, and I'll cut out the jokes, and I'll just uh, really pick up on I suppose crystallize it down to one, one key point that I was going to, was at the core of my presentation anyway. And it picks up on this theme that uh, was introduced actually in our early keynotes uh, speech from Linda Doyle about the good institution, the good university. And at the heart of QQI's approach to quality assurance over the last 10 years has been how do we build institutions, tertiary institutions, because an inclusive, stable, thriving society needs inclusive stable and thriving institutions. And what does an external quality assurance agency and, and, and the process that it underpin, that it implements do, but helps to those institutions to provide accounts. So Paul Giller talked there about the tension between enhancement and accountability. I'm not sure that we nearly, really have a tension between enhancement and accountability. External quality assurance can provide an opportunity for institutions to articulate their own uh, self-image, their own efforts to reconcile the inner and the outer layers of the donut, because it can't be done by an agency. It can't be done at a, at a whole national system level. It has to be done at, at, at close quarters, those reconciling those various tensions, those various issues of inclusivity and so on that we heard about. And what an external quality assurance process does is it, is it holds up a mirror to get, for the institution to give an account, first of all, to give an account to itself, because the institution is, not, is, is internally uh, diverse. It's a community of students, teachers, and those other staff members who are contributing, collaborating with, with, with the students and, and teachers and lecturers. And, and on the first instance, the first instance, the external quality assurance provides a mechanism for the institution to see itself, and secondly, then to share that account and for that account to be provided and, and, and filtered through to the wider variety of stakeholders. That again, I won't go through the list that Paul Giller had. Um, and QQI has a diversity of uh, different sectors that we're dealing with, and that actually is a strength because it means that. We couldn't use one size fits all even if, even if we tried, even if we wanted to. In fact, what, what, we've, what we've learned is that a, sec set a sector like the Education and Training Board sector that's going through its inaugural round of quality reviews, and I was speaking to one of the directors earlier, uh, they face a very different kind of challenge, a different wake up than, uh, and, and different effort to explain internally what they're doing, explain externally what they're doing, than um, the uh, universities that have been going through, uh, the higher education institutions going through the Kincha cycle, which is their, essentially their third cycle of external reviews. It, they're still learning as individual institutions and still learning as a sector. Um, and there is still a, a story, there are still stories to be told, um, but the way in which we tell them is different for each of those sectors. And I think in the coming years, we will be looking at what's the, the, the next stages. We've heard about some of the pointers, uh, some of the drivers that are present in the international scene and indeed in the national scene. How do we relate to uh, the um, 
changed funding environment to the changed institutional environment brought about by the Higher Education Act and the new, the new powers and roles of, of the HEA, uh, the new funding regimes in, in further education and training, and the uh, new, new source of information available about the system and how, how, is, how are we going to work with the institutions to have those new data sources, new, new drivers rolled into their stories and then expressed out so that we can better build confidence in the system. And that's, uh, that's our task in the next couple of years. So um, that's where our future is going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you to all of the delegates and all of the speakers from QQI and from everywhere else for taking part today and for all of you for, all of you for taking part in what was a great day today.